listen, you got to listen fast, all right? And this, you know what? Well, this is two parts, I mean, you know, but uh, the Lord is good. Amen. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. In just a bit of our share, um, I want to have us just spend a little time, just a moment, a few minutes, just um, to be point. One of the things that's laid in my heart today is be reminded that God's Spirit is God's Spirit is upon us. And the oil of the living is the anointing, like the Christ of the anointing. And I want to remind us that God's oil is the anointing. Is it something? Everybody listen fast. Well, not fast, but listen good. In the 1870s, a major retailer headquartered in Chicago was created. It's called Montgomery Ward. Now, I guess people don't know anything about Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward. I the guy's first name. His middle name was Montgomery, last name was Ward. But we call it what? Ward. We call it Ward for the S on it. In fact, it's Montgomery Ward, but we call it Ward so much that their website is wards.com. <laughs> They started in 1872 and 1875, they coined the phrase, Gar satisfaction guarantee for your money back. Wow. That's doing my research, I thought that was Sears, I'm going Sears boy. Sears, I think it's in college. Worked there. Um, kept in the business, wearing the grandmas and all that stuff. But I was a kid, tough skin, don't know nothing about the young guy. I was a stuff with alligators. I was getting out of way back Tough skin, way, way, way back then. But satisfaction guarantee for money Back. Today I'm going to talk about Jesus' lesson on satisfaction. And I want you all to really listen and drink deeply. Because it has some, some relevance to our lives and to our walk and to what God wants to say and do with us. Let me just say this before I get back in this message. I appreciate the congregation that allows us to flow in God's spirit. I know when spirit goes like that, that's not what everybody broke around. And I'm not trying to get back to my roots, I'm trying to get back to my God. I'm finding so many ways to find God in the solitude of scripture and reading and meditation. But in scripture, they would shout and, and, and praise God aloud. But thank you all for not just rushing with the spirit and just say, I got your body here. Thank you, because I appreciate that because there's so many folks who are here because of that, because that's allowed to happen. Yes. There are folks who are not here because they don't want that to happen. And there are so many people who long to have that happen, but they're afraid that when God comes and messes up your message and your, your order and stuff, that it's too, it's, it's too unorganized and it just seems too messy. And thank you for whether you like it or not, you're just tolerant. Because you ain't got to like God, but you've got to obey God and praise God. It's our relationship. And so, satisfaction guarantee. I'm going to talk about satisfaction that is offered to us through God through because of Christ. Um, because... I wanted to really fulfill what God has called us to do. Before I get to the passage that we read in John 7, let me put that up. Before we get to John 7, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in John 6. Because you can't just pull things out of context. And then just run with it. In John 6, Jesus is struggling. He's struggling in, in embracing and walking in what God wants him to do. And what God wants him to do. You know, I used to read scripture thinking that Jesus knew exactly everything as, as it was going to happen. But he said on enough occasion, hey, some things I don't know, the Father's got to reveal it, I don't know what I see the Father do. There are things he made it really clear where it showed that, that he really was fully God when he was walking through the limitations of humanity that helps me. I struggle with ministry. I struggle with the way he's called. I struggle with what God wants me to do sometimes. And I know that you do. It seems frightening and daunting and, and, and overwhelming. And so when I see Jesus wrestling with these things, it gives me strength that the Jesus who understands it can keep me through. And so in John 6, none of things are going on. Jesus feels, um, um, in John 6, Jesus feeds the five thousand, walks on the water. Um, after doing all of this stuff, the religious leaders still say, well, we don't think you're the Messiah because, um, well, you know, in the old, the days of old, you know, the father and the prophets gave um, man bread from heaven, and so show us a sign. He just took fish and bread and fed a whole nation. I mean, 5,000 people. Do you understand that 75% of the communities in Wisconsin have less than 5,000 people? And Jesus fed the community. They said, What's the sequel? What can you do for us? How can you show us? And so, um, 
He's going through these things. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm the man that come down, that's come down from heaven. And uh, your, your, your ancestors ate manna, but they died. I'm going to give you some bread, and, and, and you're not going to die. So who is this? I'm going to come down from heaven. It's like, yeah, man. Then he said, my life, my flesh is the bread. My life gives you life with God. Ain't that bread of God? I'm going to sacrifice myself so that you can live forever with God. They got mad. The disciples turned their backs on him. It's interesting. I just, I just got to say this here. That's what I'm they got mad and turned their backs and left the, the Judas stay. There's some people you wish would leave. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that the people that, oh, we're not going to do, we ain't going to eat your blood, we're not going to drink your blood, eat your body. Oh, that's gross, I'm gone, but Judas just stayed right there. Listen, everybody been hanging around. I'm going to come with y'all. <laughs> But you need to understand that when God starts shaking stuff up, it's still not the end of the story. You better still, you better watch your back. Yeah. And eternal Jesus. Now this is this is painful too. During one of my many travels over this uh, over over this the month off, um, um, there are these cool movies on the airline, so I watched King in the Wilderness. Has anyone seen that? It's like a documentary on Martin Luther King Jr. It's a little different. Some of his close friends that are watching it. I don't know if it's just one of those airline things, but it's called King in the Wilderness. And it's uh, just a bunch of folks that just not just the regular folk here talking about King, but others. But they're telling the story about after he spoke out against the Vietnam War, um, many of his folks stuck to the back of him, and not just white supporters, but black supporters that are blasting him. But it's interesting when he told the story, you could look in his eyes and see the detachment. He even developed a twitch that I didn't know. That he had, he had just sort of a, sort of a, like he would be talking and he would stop and just sort of stand like they, I saw it on film, I wouldn't have believed it. And, um, um, and so they asked him later, I think it was Andy, Andy Young asked him, hey, you fix the, the, the twitch? And he said, yeah, I wrestled the father and I come to her for death. He said, I found that if you don't, if you're not afraid of losing money and popularity, if you're not afraid of losing your life, you can do some magnificent things like but when the friends, you know, I watched them shoot in the crowd and he ducked and he did the still back to back. But when those friends turned their back, you could see the light. When I think they became resigned to death because they didn't have his back. Not just that they backslid. People can go out from among you and not say anything about you. They can just forget that you were there to brush the dust off your feet. But when they turn their back, I mean, every time somebody says, what about Jesus? Let me tell you about Jesus. Guess what I heard? Guess what I saw? Yeah, it's true. Then women was washing his feet with their hair. <laughs> he was up in Gangster's house, drinking stuff off, drinking wine made with drug money, tax collector money. And so he's carrying that. Then chapter 7 happens. And it's the shit on brothers down here when they say, basically, go ahead with your bad stuff. Go on up to the festival. Since you all God, go show them, go shake or do something. Jesus said, and this is interesting, I don't have time to pack this, I said this quickly. Jesus said, no, I'm not going. Then he goes. That's a whole message I'm working on. <laughs> he says, no, I'm not going. Then he goes. I think this is demonstrating the struggle. But he goes and he's hidden in his background. Let me say this quickly. And he goes secretly to have to do the festival. He steps up and he begins to preach and he begins to teach. And he begins to say things to the folks like, y'all don't really know the Father, but if you knew the Father, you would be trying to kill me. And, and, you know, and so this is interesting. Nobody's talking about death here, but he knows it's in their minds. And so Jesus is in the temple. And to me, it's something he's processing. He's just like, hey, y'all have been trying to kill people. They didn't reply back. You tripping. Ain't nobody ever been trying to kill you. Who trying to kill you? We haven't said anything about killing you. And Jesus goes on to just talk to them about their faith and their lack of faith. It's just going on. Until he preached so hard until he went and got the temple priest to detain him. And they detain Jesus. But as you read further, it says, but at the end, at the culmination, you know, when you go to a conference, they put like the closing speaker up on the last night. You know, you got people that will open up for, you know, they're the, for the, for the, um, they're the opening act for the real headliner. They're the ones that come in and open things up. But you know that, that the one you might be missing, you might miss that. You want to come for the big act. You want to come for that. It's the big day when Jesus comes. And he begins to say, so the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood up saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. 
He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this is for concerns of the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. But the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. I want to talk a little bit about satisfaction, and I want to invite us to place prayer. Satisfaction is an interesting thing. He tells the disciples, he tells people that are listening. And let me first let me just put the context here. They've already detained Jesus once. He comes back on the last day to give this message. If your life is at stake and you've already been detained, and you go through the whole process, they got the light in your face, they ask you questions, they fingerprint you, they tell you where not to go, they're, 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 they're putting their limitations on you, and you break the rules to come right back to where you are to give a message, you better listen to what that person has to say. It's almost like a deathbed confession. There are things that people say at certain points of their lives that make you want to listen. You gotta understand, it's not that Jesus had a calendar saying, on this exact day you're going to die. He was struggling because is this the day they're going to get me? Is this the day they're going to take me? But he makes sure that he got a message to the disciples and to us. If you thirst, I want you to know that you can come to me and out of here, but out of your being from inside of you, as the scriptures have said, will come rivers of living water. He spoke this concerning God the Holy Spirit. A couple things I want to say about this passage. Where we as people get in trouble is that we look for satisfaction to come outside. That's why we're in bad relationships. That's why we're in debt. That's why we're overweight. That's why we have disease. Large. That's why we have certain kinds of things that's going on. Because of trying to get somebody outside to satisfy us on the inside. Stay with me. But Jesus says something that's very interesting. He says, if you're thirsty, if you're thirsty, come to me, follow me, and out of your innermost being yes. is going to flow rivers of living water. Yes, he was trying to tell them that not only will the Holy Spirit regenerate you, not only will the Holy Spirit give you new life, but the Holy Spirit has the ability, I want the church to hear this, to satisfy. Now, if I got right now and said, I have a problem with satisfaction or being satisfied, you're wondering if I'm saying, I don't want to be satisfied or, or it's a problem to be satisfied. Are you saying that you're just, you're just complacent and you don't want anything more? What are you really saying when you're struggling with satisfaction? I want to tell you, glad you asked. What does satisfaction look like in terms of what Jesus is talking about? What does it mean? Because Jesus is referring to what we probably think of Isaiah 55, where, where the prophet said, hey, if, if you're hungry, if you don't have money, come on and get satisfied. If you're thirsty, come and I will give you drink. Hunger and thirst signifies your most basic human need. The attack of the church, the attack on the church today is that we are strapped. We're in a, we're in a, a dichotomized faith or reality. That we claim a God of the hereafter and we try to get satisfaction here and now. That the concept of delayed gratification means nothing to many of us. And we don't look to God to be our everything. Jesus said, I'm going to go to the Father and send the Spirit to you. And the Spirit is going to saturate you. And the Spirit is going to satisfy you. Because the Spirit puts our motives in check and in order. That the work of the Holy Spirit is to take what we have seen through God the Son, the, the, the image of God, the likeness of God, the, 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 the form of God, the love of God, and work it inside our hearts. And the Spirit is going to give us satisfaction. Now this is interesting. Can we put this slide about or we put up this slide about the word satisfaction comes from this. The word satiety. It's just pronounced by different time, but satiety is easy for me. <laughs> Miriam Webster says it's the quality of state of being fair or gratified to or beyond capacity for this. 
It's the revulsion or disgust of cause for open indulgence or excess. This is kind of interesting. I never think of satisfaction meaning that I'm going to be sickened by the thought of more. You ever have a good meal? I mean, it's really good. I mean, you got to take your shoes off and finish it. You got to pull your shirt out and finish it. You got to loosen your belt to finish it. And you eat, and you go a little further, you eat, you go a little further, you eat. But you eat so much that you're full and you're satisfied. Here's how you know you're satisfied that the thought of one more bite makes you sick. What happens to people who have not learned that measure, that gate of satisfaction, is we go over stuff even when it begins to hurt us. Because the Spirit of God has not taught us, hey, 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 this is enough. But you hear me, I'm not talking just about discipline. I want the satisfaction of the Spirit of God inside me to the point that what the enemy shows me sickens me. I don't want to just say, no Satan, no Satan, no Satan, no Satan, I rebuke the little, I really want to be no Satan. I want to be so satisfied by the Holy Spirit that I grab my stomach and say, devil, you've got to be out of your mind. I want to be so satisfied by the Spirit, a prayerfulness, that the thought of not praying to a God who satisfies me repulses me. I want to be so in love with the idea of being in God's presence that the thought of not being in God's presence makes me sick. I don't always want to live in a way that I can't say, God, keep the devil that bay. God, this is a certain food I don't care how you do it, what you do to it, I don't want it. You can blend up beets, you can tell me how it's good for your blood, you can tell me that it's good food for your blood, you can tell me that if you put stuff in this, you can make it taste like chicken. I don't want beets, I don't want liver, you can put it in onions and red onions and barbecue sauce and all the stuff I want. We've been living on the edge thinking we've got to get up every day walking in tension, thinking we got to beat the devil up and say no to the devil every day. I want to be so full with God that there's no room to say yes to the devil. I want to be so full and so saturated by God's spirit that the idea of not walking in God's way and not walking in God's teaching and not telling people about Christ sickens me. I don't want God to be a struggle to do what's right. I don't want to have it so hard. Okay, God, I got to give you another dollar. Okay, God, I got to tell this friend about you. Okay, God, I got to bring up Christ. Okay, God, I got to be the moral voice in the situation. I want to be so full of God that when I have an opportunity to do what God wants me to do, it sickens me to not do it. I want to be so satisfied and so full by God's spirit that that's what happens to me. You know, those of you who know nutrition, just give me a few more minutes before we pray. Understand this, the whole secret, and maybe it's right or wrong, let me just say this, of fiber. Yeah. Fiber will fool you. Fiber will make you think you need more than you need. Because you eat it, it satisfies you, but the thought of going behind it is to no, 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 no. The Spirit wants to infuse enough of God in us that we are not a threat to committing mutiny against our God. God has been too good for my base nature to deny God. He's dealt with angels and fallen angels and principalities and lies and the crucifixion of his son. God does not deserve for me to be lazy. He does not deserve for me to be haphazard. And God does not deserve for me to be living by my wills and by my emotions and by my desires. But he is God and he can satisfy me. He can satisfy me. Let me just mention this. In the garden, we were created in God's likeness and image. It's the form and it's the function of God. It doesn't mean that you look like God. God, this is spirit, you can tell that God can't be cast and told. Hey, you know, that's what some of you all theology is okay. You said scripture says God's spirit. We just thought because we were created in God's likeness and image with the God looks like. What it means is the form and fashion of God's spirit or spirit and function to have authority in the earth. We were created to do that. When we committed sin, we lost the form of God and we lost the function of God's work in the earth. The work of the Holy Spirit not only brings us into the body of Christ, it restores the breath of God in us. I'm telling you all this in many ways over and over. It restores the breath of God so that the spirit of God, the form of God is established in us. But the authority to move on his behalf in the world is restored to us too. The enemy wants the church weakened by not understanding that God, the Holy Spirit, is inside of us, restoring us to a state better than what Adam and Eve had.
had. Because it is divine presence inside of us building the form and the function of God. Which means the church can't just look at problems and shake our heads. We're here to bring solutions to Christ. The church can't just look at people who are hungry and shake our heads. We gotta make some food happen. We can't look at people who are alone and say, that's sad. We gotta build relationships to bring people in. We can do more than good. We have been saved and filled with God's Spirit in order to be restored to the image and the likeness of God. Everything the Spirit touched and shaped, God said, it is good. The Spirit is developing stuff inside you that is good. Yes. Not your intellect, not your ability, not your looks, not your money. The Spirit is developing fruit. Developing character that God is saying is good and the fruit satisfies. Because the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of eternal life, it assures us that the Father won't forget us. And the Holy Spirit assures the Father that we neglect the Father's ways. Do you hear what I say? The Holy Spirit, when you have the down payment, I talked about this part before. I talked about it before, just basically when you have the down payment, if you don't, if you don't come and get it, it takes you, you, know, you lose your money. But it's deeper than that. If I have, if I have a landlord with my government board, I have a commitment to live with my money. But they have a commitment to live with my body until I come back. It works both ways. The Holy Spirit is a guarantee that the government of us would not leave us. But it is also a guarantee to the Father that the Spirit will shape us and turn us. I will take the weight of trying to be who God wants you to be out of your hands. Because we can't be good humans on our own. So you know we can't be good right because of God's presence. We can't be good. It's good as we want to be good parents. We find out that it's our priorities and stuff that we're doing. And as good as we try to be, it's still some self destroying But God's Spirit working in us the power and the flow of God to satisfy who God is in us. Because if you're not satisfied, you're not satisfied to be enticed. I want to give this example that I want to pray. This is a weird example so I'm just going to make it okay. That's really weird. It's kind of a family thing that's weird. In my family, that's not my children. In my family, again, this is this may sound. Just give me grace, the saints, okay? In my family, it was okay for men to like money, but not for girls, because the fear was if girls liked money, a man would entice you as a child to do something. And there's no wrong people. But if a girl in our family loved money, that was a bad, that was like pre fast. I don't have to turn the table fast. <laughs> but there was this thought that if you, there was all these protective things. And it's just unsaid. Of course, it's just an indication of something just going on. But there are two big no no's. You could not sit on a grown person's man's lap, and you could not like money. Because that love for money would entice you. The Holy Spirit satisfies us so that we are not enticed. There are things that we fall into because we have not allowed the Holy Spirit to satisfy us. We overspend because the Holy Spirit has not taught us how to accept it. We overeat because we're trying to satisfy some other kind of emptiness. So we destroy ourselves. I'm trying to get myself back. You don't have to be obese to be able to use things wrong, but I know that when I'm stressed and when I'm worried and when I'm trying to figure stuff out, chewing seems to have to get my mind together. God has got to give me peace and satisfaction. Not people's opinion, not people's accolades, but God has got to be enough. The work of the Holy Spirit is to tell believers God's got you. God's enough. God's got you. God's enough. God's got you. God's enough. So you fail, get back up. So you struggle, get back up. So you mess up, get back up. God's enough. God has got you. 
It's not just a reprimand, it's not just a special eraser, but it actually brings a level of satisfaction. I want what you do for God to stop being strong. I want to be your children. Think about something you detest that makes you see you've had enough, you don't want it anymore. It is not even a struggle. I want the witnesses in your life and the attacks of you. The team that I asked to come up with some prayer meetings come and get a pleasure just a moment. Here's what I want to say. And listen, I don't want to take a long time. And prayer team, you're going to get alongside the wall if you're going to pray. Let me just do this. God knows where we're from. And that's why He sends the Spirit to satisfy. There's something I want us to do as we come. I want us to be reminded that God's Spirit is with us. It's why I'm my team anointed. And I also want you to be anointed because I want you to be marked as a designation of the Holy Spirit. So when they anoint you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I want to just put this mark on you so that you know. You have this reminder, God lives inside of me. But at the same time, I want it to be almost like a language. I want the enemy to, I want the, I want the enemy to know you are marked by God. And I want that to be sort of as an invitation by the Holy Spirit to fall even Just what I'm going to pray in general. I'm actually going to stay closer to the eyes. You know, I'm going to always in front. For those of you that are anointed, I want you to understand that right at the beginning of the eyes. Whoever wants to do this, I want to invite you to listen. We're not going to pray in the eyes. But because I know it's so important for us to be reminded that the Holy Spirit is what's all, that when we talk about it, we think it's for songs, for the spiritual, for the prayer, people, for the preacher. No, it's for everyone. And I want you to be reminded that the Spirit is offering you satisfaction. I have God touch your knee, God touch your knee, and God will be with you. And so, Lord, I just pray that as we just take these few moments to anoint the body, that you remind us of your presence. Jesus, you spared your life, you broke out at a meeting at a conference at a festival you know they're trying to kill you to say you are thirsty let me satisfy you but it's not coming from the outside let me satisfy the reason for your existence through the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit will make sense of your life and allow you to follow God as team begins to pray just come and get in the line and listen People that are anointed, we're not praying for both. We're just anointing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But if you need more prayer, once you come through and anointed, don't worry, let's just not come and get you. Just line up as you want to come. And then once you come through and you're anointed, you've got people on the side. But I just want the people that are just want our believers who are here just to come forward and allow us just to anoint you, to remind you of God's pleasure.